Hello everyone, welcome to the GDC Twitch channel. Uh, uh, I am your host, Bryant Francis. I am here today playing a neat little game. Uh, not that little, but uh, a neat game called uh, Age of Wonders Planetfall. Uh, Age of Wonders Planetfall comes to you from Triumph Studios and Paradox Interactive. Um, uh, with me today, in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, um, is Triumph Studios co-founder, Leonard Suss. Leonard, how you doing? Hi, doing well. How are you? Good. Just released the game, and nice. it's, uh, it's out in the world, and people are not super angry, and they seem to like it, so that's great. Nice. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, with me also, saying nice, uh, um, is Alyssa McAloon, um, straight from Gama Sutra. How are you doing, Alyssa? I am doing well. Wide awake. Wide awake. Wide awake. Uh, no Wide do awake. Any dogs hanging out there, Alyssa? Uh, she has been bribed by a delicious lunch, so she is over over there minding her own business. You can also bribe me with a delicious... Readers at home, if you are, you can also bribe me... Viewers <laughs> at home, you can also bribe me with a delicious lunch if you ever wish to fly my ear. Um, we're here today with Leonard uh, playing Age of Wonders Planetfall. This is a 4X strategy game uh, that has some turn-based uh, turn 4X strategy game. Um, with another layer of turn-based combat uh, that debuted uh, just a couple weeks ago. It's the latest game in the Age of Wonders series, which if you're a strategy aficionado, you may have played before. Um, uh, it's been in development since 1999. And Leonard, you've been working on this series for like 20 years, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's been, uh, we started this out in, in, uh, in university. We met with a couple of uh, you know, certain like-minded uh, friends. Uh, we uh, thought to mix uh, match a bunch of genres together like uh, strategy rpg even adventuring at first and that's when the age of wonder series start to emerge mm -hmm. of course the first games were fantasy based mm -hmm. and uh, planetfall is our first venture into sci-fi mm -hmm. and also uh, the first time we brought the game to consoles mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're here to discuss uh, the design and development of Age of Wonders Planetfall. Um, if you are one of the fine folks watching at home, be advised you can ask questions for Leonard in chat, and we will throw them to him when possible. Um, to get things started, Leonard, um, uh, Age of Wonders has been in development for uh, about four years. We were talking about this before. Um, what for you has uh, development been like, uh, how, and how is it like? How has four years of development transitioned into making this game right here? Yeah, this is an awful long while. I think it's uh, almost the longest that we spend on a on a, on a game uh, ever. Uh, maybe the very first one, but that's one we were working sort of like semi professionally on it. Uh, so. Yeah, we we started off, of course, uh, you know, looking at how how do we make a new game, a new turn-based strategy game. The idea to make um, uh, a um, sci-fi version came yeah shortly after we don't affect that, that we wanted to to keep on making turn-based games, but we didn't want to make a direct sequel to Age of Wonders three, and we thought it was a would be a great match to try a sci-fi universe. And um, Age of Wonders has always been a war-focused game mm -hmm. uh, with lots of like knights and castle sieges and, and uh, medieval uh, war equipment. We thought it would be a great match if we try and model all those cool battles and the cool empire building in a sci-fi universe. So replace archers with uh, marines with machine guns and uh, cavalry with tanks, uh, spells with orbital laser cannons. And we basically started there and, and soon after the ID started uh, flowing. Uh, but we wanted to do some radical uh, shifts as well, including the way the economy works, um, the way that you basically conquer the map using um, sectors. So there's been a, a very long prototyping phase, of perhaps uh, yeah, one and a half year, I would say, where we started experimenting with these new uh, combat mechanics, new diplomacy, new uh, e economic features. And when that all uh, was sorted, we uh, went into production. Uh, the game features six uh, unique factions, all with their own tech trees. So working that out with, uh, you know, detailed units, uh, detailed animations, sound effects and everything. It's just a big amount of production. And during the production period, we um, were acquired by Paradox Interactive, mm -hmm. which of course was a, um, uh, a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a distraction, but I would say that it did prolong the the, uh, the development a little bit uh, you know of course a lot of like senior people during such a process are busy with with other stuff mm -hmm. and then after the uh, when it, uh, um, 
when that acquisition process was completed, we started to looking into, okay, how can we, you know, see what, what can we do more with this type of game? And soon the idea came along, like, let's try this on console. It's a new IP as well. It's, it's not a fantasy IP, it's we call Planetfall, it's not a sequel. Uh, so we said, okay, let's, let's see if we can transition this on console. And that's uh, when an, uh, the entire interface had to be reworked uh, to be uh, multi-platform friendly. Uh, all those hundreds of windows, pop-ups, panels, all needed to be changed. Um, and uh, yeah, that was an, uh, probably a year of work, I would say. Of course, the port itself, uh, multiplayer, um, working on all those di different platforms too, was a tremendous task. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how those years fill up, yeah. The time flies, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, with, because this is the first, you've brought uh, games in Overlord to console before, but this is the first in the Age of Wonder series to come to consoles too, right? Correct? Yeah, yeah. Cool. I can tell you that this this was actually a lot more work uh, to bring to consoles than, uh, than a game like Overlord. Uh, mm -hmm. The entire control scheme uh, of Overlord was a lot more suited to, uh, or e easy to, to port. I, I would say that a turn-based game is very much suited for a... Um, console game, there's just more work involved in uh, transferring all these interfaces. Yeah, I was going to say, this is kind of like a, it, this uh, this whole genre, like both your your kind of duality genres you have here, they both um, are kind of synonymous with PC for me, so it's interesting the decision to kind of like branch out into consoles, and Brian's playing on PlayStation 4 mm -hmm. right now too, so you can, you can see that like it applies itself well to the controller and everything too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, there, there are not many games out there. I mean, uh, per uh, Paradox recently ported Stellaris, mm -hmm. uh, they're a big for a Space 4X game uh, to console, and that uh, yeah was a, an, an experiment which turned out well. Um, of course, in the past there was Civilization Revolutions on the previous generation of consoles, and of course we have the very popular tactical turn-based games. Mm -hmm. and of mm -hmm. course, our, our game has a very a large tactical component as well. Uh, so games like XCOM or uh, Fire Emblem do, do very well on consoles. Mm -hmm. Right on. Uh, to move on uh, into the next question, so you 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 go from you said you want to make a new game, uh, um, uh, that uh, a new Age of Wonders game after Age of Wonders three. Um, what was kind of the foundation? Like you you made a sci-fi version of a series you already had, what was the decision to to sort of adapt the series you had for a new franchise as opposed to building a new IP ground up that would be like strictly science fiction only? Which you've sort of halfway done, but there's still kind of a fantasy component to it, I guess? Maybe a little bit, but the IPs are as different as, for example, Warcraft and Starcraft or Warhammer and Warhammer 40k. If there's any links, they're very subtle. Um, but it's mainly the reason why we kept on kept on calling it Age of Wonders was uh, that the gameplay formula is is similar. Um, uh, the, the the split between the strategy and the tactical layer. Uh, so just like uh, you have like the Total War games or StarCraft and Warcraft, you you have the same sort of formula applied to uh, two different settings, <coughs> which which are not just reskins, but actually the uh, fun, the, and the large part of the gameplay. I think has fundamentally changed. Right on. Um, uh, what then was kind of your foundation for? I, re I was reading some interviews where you and your teammates were talking about um, with making uh, making new factions. One of your goals was to make sure that uh, all the factions, that every single unit within each faction was unique from faction to faction. Uh, by comparison, in Age of Wonders three, every unit had a soldier, an archer, a a cavalry unit, kind of that, and then then some uniqueness emerged from there. But but that was that's obviously a big design choice change to to make a instead of a, a top down structure for your unit to make every single unit unique. What was kind of the process for executing that? Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a uh, um, yeah long iterative process. Basically, we start mm -hmm. off uh, uh, you know making good, rich gameplay mechanics uh, that mm -hmm. allow for these various play styles, especially when you talk about units, you talk about combat, uh, to ensure that the, the, the core mechanics, the, the systems um, are um, diverse and rich enough that allow for various uh, combat roles, uh, mm -hmm. including uh, 
you know, units that can, um, you know, have a more of an assault ranged weapon support units, units that use cover, units that can fly, units that can heal, units that, uh, you know, have all sorts of various uh, area of effect damage units that can you know, hop around the battlefield, um, you know, units that can dig, units that uh, can stagger or be immune to stagger. Um, that so that it starts with basically with the with the mechanic and just a, a radical upgrade of the combat mechanics that we had in front in Age of Honest Three. Right on. Uh, Alyssa, I'm going to toss the question ball to you because I'm trying to juggle a bunch of objectives that just popped up. Mm. Yeah, so unlike Brian, I haven't had hands-on uh, time with your game quite yet. But uh, So your campaigns, does each uh, faction have their own campaign there? Or is it yeah. all kind of... Okay, so um, how... I'm trying to figure out how I want to word this, but with each of the factions being so different, they're obviously going to appeal to different kind of players. Mm -hmm. um, how do you kind of design those, I guess, to have kind of like mass appeal while also encouraging people to get out of their comfort zones while giving people more of what they want when they finish one campaign and going into the next. I guess, how do you kind of like accomplish that entire beast of making each faction interesting but appealing to as many people as possible? Um, well, we, we obviously have um, various factions that, that have a like a, so some of more, some of them are more mainstream, I would call like like sort of like a mainstream pop song that is you know sort of a friend to everybody, not too mm -hmm. complex, not too quirky. Uh, of course, most games or most strategy games have what we call the human faction, mm -hmm. which are easy uh, to identify with. And when you look at a unit, you sort of see its function. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a tank is a tank, a walker, an, an aircraft, or a ship. Uh, you know, maybe they wear, have different types of li uh, rifles. Um, but, you know, what you see is what you get, basically. And, um, you know, from there you go into more extreme forms, including like alien insectoids or, um, you know, sort of like cyborg trash assembly um, units, which, which are harder to um, sort of immediately put your finger on what they do. You need to click on them and look at their ability lists and say, ah, uh -huh, you do this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we have a single player campaign, which is basically used as an introduction to the entire um, series. Mm -hmm. um, and next to that, we have uh, the standalone scenarios, which is a lot more similar to sort of like your civilization um, open-ended type of gameplay, where mm -hmm. you basically choose your victory condition that you want to proceed, and it's, uh, it's sort of like a free-for-all. And uh, just um, a lot of people actually skip the campaign and just go straight into that. Mm -hmm the more advanced players and of course you can also play these scenarios in multiplayer mm -hmm. um, but yeah if, you, if you're a beginner to this type of game uh, we encourage you to to start playing the campaign and and maybe start with human faction first mm -hmm. <laughs> which is exactly what we've done as you've <laughs> no doubt ascertained um uh just a quick reminder for chat we are happily taking your questions if you've got any for leonard uh don't be shy we'd love to hear from you there's like 20 folks out there that's a good sign that some of you are interested in age of wonders um uh i'm gonna go to my question pile leonard um what i would like to know um uh you did, there was something interesting that was pointed out in one interview is that compared to previous uh unlike other strategy games when a game of age of wonders starts age of wonders plan fall starts um, you don't jump right into your research tree, your your uh, your 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 sort of you exploit or exploitation system is what it's called in this game. But just like telling your cities what to focus on producing, you don't jump into those right away with this. It's deliberately staggered out. Um, uh, can you walk through the decision to sort of slightly tweak traditional conventions of the 4x genre and what it means for players uh, to not be diving into those choices right away or every single turn? Right. Okay. Now you have to go to the nature of, uh, of of Age of Wonders and how it differs from the other games. And basically, what uh, also I think one of the reviewers, I don't know if it was PC Gamer or uh, IGN, basically said that Age of Wonders is sort of like a fast-paced forex. The mm -hmm. what they call turn density, so the amount of things that you do in a single turn, mm -hmm. is um, is higher than than in uh, other titles. Uh, so you can fight multiple battles, multiple pickups. Also, the, for example, the research times tend to be shorter. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And part of that comes from the, the sort of war game, multiplayer-like uh, nature of the game. Um, 
So in this sense, so especially in the, those early turns, a, a lot could happen if you basically open up research and open up uh, scouting, doing your first battle, making, recruiting your first hero, and doing that everything in turn one would sort of like front load that entire turn uh, before you really get your bearing. Mm -hmm. So we said at one point we said okay, there's so much happening in turn one. Let's let's delay research one turn. So mm -hmm. you, you at least get to uh, see the lay of the land a little bit. Just, just to maybe spend your first turn scouting and see whether or not uh, you have water nearby or um, what type of enemies you'll be facing in the in, in the first couple of rounds. And then the turn after, you can start making your your research decisions uh, based on that uh, uh, lay of the land. And the game is a little bit more welcoming to to beginning players that they don't get you know uh, that first turn isn't loaded with all sorts of decisions to make right away. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, uh, what do you think um, as far as acquiring like like the forex strategy genre has been around for a while, and some of the games in it are really popular. Some of them are a little more niche. Um, what do you think is part of the, and this is sort of part of Paradox's overall marketing strategies, what do you think is essential for, for the strategy genre to grow and to keep acquiring new players as opposed to just sort of, I mean, like there's there's obviously value in, in, in treasuring and nurturing the player base who's been with you for 20 years, but, you know, people aren't finite, I guess. We expire. Wow, that got grim. Thinking about mortality <laughs> while doing video games, but yeah, no, okay, like, but eventually people move on. They try other genres. They their life changes. Like, what do you think is sort of essential to to getting new players interested in these games in the first place? Well, actually, uh, we we've seen quite some growth in the strategy genre over the years. Yeah. Uh, I think mainly it is because um, you know people uh, gamers they they don't stop gaming when they're twenty years old. You know they they. Um, start keep on gaming when they have kids or when they get to work and a, a strategy game like uh, Age of Wonders or Pl Planetfall is, is very uh, easy to wrap around your life because it's turn based mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> also for example with the multiplayer options that we we have uh, was what we call the adaptive multiplayer system and uh, basically you, you you put your turns in the cloud mm -hmm. and uh, you can play you can download the turns when you have time to play your turn yeah. and you can upload it again but if your friends are online at the same time, you can switch that same session to sort of like a live session, and, and this game switches to simultaneous turns. Yeah, all play at once, and then I say, okay, it's now late at uh, at night, and we, I'm going to log off, and the game switches back to the uh, sort of round robin uh, turn system again. Mm -hmm. So that's an innovation that we um, that is brought to by, by by newer technology that that allows this type of game to to adapt to future age. And uh, hopefully to a, a growing group of, of gamers who, uh, who, who, you know, even when they become more mature, they, you know, they, they keep on enjoying uh, this, this medium. That's wild. I remember back in when I was playing Civilization 3 back in the old days uh, when I was eight years old. Um, uh, um, that was the email. You emailed like your turns to, to other players. Um, yeah, that was manual. Yeah, we had yeah. to just well, now everything's automated. Yeah. How how did you what, what did it take to implement a system like that? Uh, of course, very good uh, programmers with very good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, an, an ABS cloud system, mm -hmm. <laughs> which wasn't around, uh, and SIF three, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and of course, bandwidth has gotten a lot cheaper. You know, just just uh, you know, f because this basically we, we we foot the bill for those transfers but you know like earlier on you paid per megabyte so now you know the same money buys you terabytes of, of data mm -hmm. right on Alyssa, i'm going to toss the question ball to you while oh, i no. move some tips around i'm really curious about that feature because uh, like uh I, I wasn't quite the emailing turns to friends thing but like my sister and i would hurry up and we'd be in the middle of like a starcraft match and have to like oh we gotta hurry up and finish this before dad comes in and yells at us to go to bed <laughs> so like that's really cool i didn't know that uh i didn't know games did like uh strategy games had that feature this one particularly but um oh where was i gonna go with that there was a there was a thought there and it's gone I'll, I'll come back to it later, but it's really neat and it's really interesting. Um, Fishy, or sorry, Fish21 in chat wants to know what your favorite part of making a 4X or strategy game has been after doing it for as long as you have been. Ooh, uh, well, I think my favorite part is, is with each iteration is, is, is looking into how we can like, innovate. And um, part of uh, the work I enjoy is, is looking back 
and uh, like long running series, not necessarily forex series, but just long running genres, and to see how they uh, try to survive uh, and mm. how they evolve or fail to evolve over the years, and why genres or even uh, or individual game series um, uh, rise or fall, and that is. Um, of course, that that makes trying to um, walk the fine line between innovation and uh, and and you know not losing the connection with your fan base and trying to innovate. And that that's I think one of the main uh, challenges that that you have when running the series so long. And when it comes to for X design in itself, um, yeah, it's just the the enormous challenge of of making a game that is so. Um, complex and and so there's so many subsystems you know the economy the diplomacy the combat mm -hmm. um and that needs to play out over like a session can last anywhere from six to 12 hours a typical session and you can play it uh, on, in so many different ways and and the game needs to be stable and it can basically adapt to people playing in a particular way mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that experience uh, a lot of people come into such a game also with entire different expectations some people just want to play very casually and do some empire building build cities while others really are super aggressive competitive players who uh, like to digest every little unit ability and see how they can use that in their favor and they're, they're, you know they, they play such a game very differently from the more casual empire builder uh, but still we need to appeal to both of both of these type of gamers and just having a game that that tries to do it all is is is, is a challenge and it's also for, uh, a lot of fun to do in your picking oh, oh, no, go, go, go no you go for it Alyssa. <laughs> i was gonna say picking into that process a little bit what's like obviously you were working on this game for four years what's kind of like the iteration the trial and error process to making sure oh this is leaning too heavy in one direction so it's not fun for players who play this way yeah. how do you make everyone happy without kind of like sacrificing the character of a game yeah, that is very difficult. I mean, during the process of prototyping, we basically split the, the team up into various uh, mini teams, which all get assigned to work on a particular uh, function. And, and especially when, at first, you don't have the full backbone of the, of the full ecosystem of the game running, and you, you know, some of these features are created in a vacuum, it is very hard to uh, see of if such a feature is fun or not. Um, so you try to sort of simulate an environment and try to sort of like role play or 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 um, maybe a board game it or something that mm -hmm. if a feature will be fun or not. And um, sometimes it, you just end up spending three months of a significant part of the team just throwing a feature away because it just and this didn't end up uh, being fun. One of the examples is a uh, sort of a large uh, sort of orbital system that we built like an entire sky layer around the planets mm -hmm. where you could uh, maneuver aircraft death stars and um, satellites and, and missiles in order to influence the world below mm -hmm. um, but that just uh, yeah didn't work it, it totally undermined what was happening below and it was because there's almost no obstacles there it, it sort of turned into a, a game of its own which wasn't fun so we just had to take, bite the bullet and, and, and scrap those uh, those those many man months worth of work. Um, but that's that's all in the game. If you would try to, to try something new. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, uh, Fish Twenty One just wants to thank you, Leonard, for answering their question and uh, Lord Sloth. Um, uh, <laughs> it jokes that people don't have the resurgence trait in real life. Um, uh, Leonard, just uh, shifting the line of questioning for a moment. Um, uh, what would you say um, uh, was kind of a? Sorry, that was not. I that was a not a good way to start this sentence. Um, I was reading one interview that one of the re another one of the reasons that you all transitioned to making Age of Wonders the way Planet all the way you did was after Age of Wonders three there was kind of a criticism that people wanted more options across the gameplay. That's sort of broadly that builds off what we talked about before about making units unique. But like you know they 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 four X games can kind of get uh, no matter how great and varied they can get they can also get a little similar. You you build your city, you colonize new cities, and then just kind of. The, the loop repeats um what was your process for finding we just sort of talked about you know trying new ideas but like what was sort of your process for finding new ways to play 4x games i guess to look for new options and new ways to get people into gameplay 
Yeah, when you're talking uh, purely about mechanics, um, the um, yeah the main criticism on Age of Wonders three was uh, that people missed some sort of like uh, str strategy layer depth, uh, including the uh, yeah the economy and the cities. Like that, when you build cities, you sort of follow the same system and the same strategy over and over again. And uh, you know there are very deep strategy games where you you know intricately manage um, your your cities like civilization obviously and you can make a lot of like little decisions that stack over a very long um, uh, period of time and uh, we said well we you know the the essence of our game is is that it's 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 a bit more war gamey and so we didn't want to have that intricacy and we didn't want to have too much micromanagement into the city so we started to look into a system where, where you could upgrade cities and expand in a more a sort of like broader strokes and make, make very large decisions that um, so we thought into uh, dividing the world up into sectors and cities expand by claiming new territories and that sort of uh, thing led to another you could easily like on paper uh, sort of see that such a sector system would have like big ramifications for diplomacy so if, if you have you know um, build up the world into these sectors you can trade them you can sort of plant a flag and then this one is mine instead of having a you know like everything that's just done on a hex level so that's um that's that's when the thing started rolling on the on, on the world map gameplay it, it, it it took a lot of iteration as well as, as to uh, like how you upgrade all these sectors, how you attach them to your main colony. Uh, th that took a lot of time, a lot of iteration. Uh, but uh, eventually, we uh, we saw yeah, this this really works, and uh, we hope that that people will will like this. And although it's it's um, something entirely new for for our series, and I think also in the uh, in the genre as a whole. So. Um, yeah, that, that sort of innovation isn't easy. It's always easier to say, like, okay, let, let's take a look and, and how has another game done this before and uh, trying to do something different um, is always painful. Right on. Uh, don't mind me over here. I'm just trying to figure out. I got a lot to juggle on my plate. Alyssa, can I just ask <laughs> the question ball your way? It's kind of enjoyable to watch you try to, like, uh, talk and make complex decisions at the same time, though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, mm, this is a little more in the wheezy about strategy games that I don't understand. Might not, might be a little over my head, but uh, Satya in chat wants to know, while we're talking about play styles, are there any plans to enable tall play styles? I'm not sure. That's lingo I'm not familiar with there, so I don't know if you can talk around different play style implementation there. Yeah, going wide at all is a strategy saying whether you're sort of like specialized, like one uh, city, uh, and, and build it up uh, as big as you can. And um, another one is wide by, by spreading yourself thin and, and claiming a lot of territory, for example. Uh, that, oh. That's different. And uh, currently, our um, city upgrade tree is, or city upgrades is, is sort of capped, you know, with the number of um, of, of provinces that you can attach to a, a colony, the number of upgrades that you can build. And obviously we're looking into expanding uh, the game in the future. A lot of these type of games, they, they are in development for years on their initial launch. Um, adding additional options for city upgrades is absolutely something that we'll be looking into. Uh, but first we need to digest and see like, how are people playing, what are people's wishes, and you know, getting you know, very uh, you know, like like solid feedback from the community saying, you know, we'd like to have deeper city management and, and uh, it's, it's something that we can do something with. And, uh, yeah. Cool. I guess like uh, one week now out from launch, how has that initial feedback been? How has the reception for the features you have gone over so far? Uh, I think overall very positive. We are at um, like around 80% uh, positive user reviews. I mean, there's some people... Uh, who, of course, compare it to, to Age of Wonders 3 and they miss a particular feature from that game and they say, like, oh, you know, we wish you would um, have this in this game as well. Or some people think that you might have strayed too far or not far enough. Uh, so it is a, <laughs> it's a fine line that you, that you need to walk. Um, yeah. But overall, oh, we, we are happy with the reception and uh, we, we look at all feedback where it doesn't matter if um, it's, it's, it's just constructive or people are 
really angry at a particular thing. We take everything at heart. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we do like to uh, respond to, uh, to the more polite kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been uh, very uh, interesting and a good uh, launch, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's always scary when you, make, uh, when you run a series for this long and see, see how people will react to it. Yeah, I guess uh, even go yeah going into like I have on my notes here I have twenty years like circled and underlined because that's a long time for a studio to be making games and also for one particular series to keep going and yeah. especially with uh, as much like um, the IP changes you've made this time around too and I guess how did you guys kind of how how did that conversation go where like hey what if we do like a slight reboot what if we go to space like how did you kind of worm your dev team into that idea as well as like warming the community up to it. Um, yeah, for the dev team, that's uh, of course uh, you know dev, dev team exists out of many individuals. Some people have uh, you know like hopes, maybe you know some of them want to uh, go back to uh, like an Overlord style game. Others uh, might want to try another uh, genre, and another side like okay, we have invested so much in in, in this engine, this tool set, mm -hmm. and, and and the experience from our people that that it would be crazy to. Uh, uh, to 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 try and swap everything around. I can tell you that when you make a drastic shift in genres, going from um, 4x strategy to action RPGs and back, is is not a, the wisest business decision that you can make. It's it's fun, <laughs> of course, but yeah. uh, make various types of games, such a radically uh, such a radically different type of games. Mm -hmm. But it's um, it's not good for your sanity. Uh, on the other hand, um, but yeah, you. you it's a, it's a process that you you can it's it's part of that's it's just a business decision uh, and another one is is a uh, a decision of like like how do we play to our strength uh, without keeping things you know uh, and, and keep things interesting uh, for everybody mm -hmm. it's always very important for us what do uh, you know us as a team this uh, what's the level of buy in for a particular project we wouldn't mm -hmm. want to make a project where people say like ah this is really not my thing i'm, I'm gonna quit my job you know it's uh really very bad yeah let's see uh oh we got a good question from chat uh winslay would like to know uh why sectors show the resource that can be exploited instead of icons for the climate and terrain um or uh they they are concerned that players are confused when they see the icons on each new sector um i kind of have no opinion about if it's confusing or not myself because when i look at a new sector i'm looking at say this sector right here i just see the world ceiling and i'm like oh that's a really good name for a place <laughs> yeah when you click on it you see a couple of um of, of uh icons which indicate the uh, potent the resource potential of a sector how it can be upgraded um so it doesn't list the the, the output uh, mm -hmm. But it actually lists uh, like this particular section. I, I, like I've got a very small screen because I'm as uh, research, production, and uh, two energy. Uh, so that one could be upgraded as a um, as an energy exploitation, and then you build energy stuff to in order to use the natural occurring uh, stuff. So we basically took that um, uh, what is it that step that translates resource type into uh, uh, what sort of resource, sorry, climb type or overlay type into resource uh, out of it so people could immediately see, oh, this is energy and I'm gonna choose my energy upgrade here. Mm -hmm. Right on. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Well, I was gonna ask about, um, you touched briefly on um, porting this over to consoles and which is a series first for you guys for this particular series. Um, and can you talk about maybe some of the like UI changes and decisions that were made to kind of make it more readable on consoles or so it would work both on PCs and consoles equally without negatively affecting the other, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first things that we did, did was um, basically um, take, took a look at all of the interfaces and which ones could be um, sort of like be the same with slight modifications like swapping yes no buttons with a and b buttons or or uh, whatever um and then interfaces which needed to have like a radical difference like like uh, adding a radio menu uh, as an example mm -hmm. then we started to look at readability and one of the things that we added was interface scaling so you could uh, scale the interface up and down 
relatively to the, the yeah, how far you were from the screen or your screen size. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was another um, yeah, must have in order for the, uh, the conversion to start. And of course, it also benefits PC if you're playing on a small laptop screen versus a very nice, large 30-inch uh, uh, monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's another one. Um, we, one of the principles that we, uh, that we applied was that we wanted to make the people move the, um, uh, the, 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 the map as, as little as possible manually so people uh, would use the event list in order to take them to all key actions that that needed their attention mm -hmm. uh, so you don't need when a, a unit needs order you center on it and just you, you select a new destination or uh, a resource is ready you just get taken to the interface you can very quickly cycle through these screens without having to um, to do many manual uh, mouse pointery things basically mm -hmm. um, so those are a couple of the uh, of, of the principles um, that we that we applied. Um, another thing is like in combat, you select units, but then immediately you see highlighted which armies it can hit from a particular location, uh, just to avoid the large number of manual movements. Mm -hmm. And of well, course, always... oh, <laughs> yeah, and of course, consistency with with other games like. Of course, we, you, know, you have like mouse and keyboard conventions. You know, when you scroll mm -hmm. the map, you have uh, W A A S D, and um, you know, left click to uh, to select, right click to move, which is sort of like an RTS thing. Mm -hmm. um, same for console. You know, you try to use conventions. Uh, you know, use the D pad and the shoulders for the right type of stuff. Um, it's always interesting to hear how like uh, bringing a game to a new platform will make like a result in these changes that actually benefit the entire thing as a whole and not just that new platform. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I just think there's been a tremendous benefit to the PC users as well. It, uh, the amount of QA that we put into this game is massive. Of mm course, -hmm. uh, there are quite a few PC players who like to play using controller. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for, from uh, well, uh, if they use uh, either Steambox or um, they just like you know sitting hanging on the couch, and uh, so we have that option available for uh, PC players too. Mm -hmm. uh, the interface scaling is available for PC. So yeah, right on. Uh, I I am diving into the the turn based kind of XCOM -y combat right now. One thing I, I guess one thing that jumps to mind um, is that X, games like X games that are dedicated to sort of the the turn based tactical like this are often. Uh, focused on um, there's a lot of uh, fog of war concepts like where is your enemy and how is that this but this game is per like these battles start out pretty out in the open and you're able to make you yeah. know you're able to plan two or three steps ahead much easier than you are in those games um, could you sort of talk about your process um, uh, for designing these sections of the game and like what and how um, uh, and really how you're able to balance it while still trying to make an overall like overarching forex game that still works Cool, yeah. So, uh, one of the first starting points is that we create a war. We don't create like a, uh, like a sort of a skirmish between like hero characters that you want to keep alive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you obviously want to keep as much uh, units alive as you can, but the combats tend to be a lot more lethal in, in a game like this. Uh, mm -hmm. They also uh, are... Um, we want them to, uh, to be over quicker. You know, our combats can involve a large number of units, not just infantry types, but also tanks and, and aircraft and whatnot. So the battles need, uh, pl uh, although superficially might sort of look the, the same, you've got uh, some cover, you got your, your overwatch, you got um, grenades and, and all that type of stuff, but they, generally they, uh, they play faster and they, they're more deadly. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, for example, Fog of War doesn't really fit in, in that thing because that would really prolong the typical battle. Mm -hmm. Although in earlier Age of Wonders games, we did have uh, single-player dungeons or P PvE dungeons, basically, which you which had sort of a cover of darkness, which you needed to sort of Diablo style. You needed to go in and explore and find the baddies uh, before you could uh, close them. Maybe we'll go back to that one day. Right on. Um, uh... Um, going to check. The crafty dog has dropped by and is really impressed with the game. They are asking about uh, a possible Nintendo Switch port. 
Um, we sort of, we, we try not to, there's sort of, um, if a feature's not announced, it's a little hard to ask about from a dev perspective on this channel. Um, mm -hmm. but I guess, you know, Leonard, uh, the Nintendo Switch is out. It's, it's a new thing that people, even Paradox is shipping games on. Um, yeah. cause they've got John Romero's game, uh, Empire of Sin coming out on Nintendo Switch. Uh, yeah. ha have you been, have you, do you have a Switch? Are you enjoying the platform? Yeah, or? yeah, I have a Switch. I, I, I you know, I play games for myself, but also with my son. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so we uh, play all the uh, Nintendo titles. Uh, got the Mario Rabbits game, yeah, sort of, mm -hmm. uh, like a like like an XCOM light type of deal. Game which is so fun. weird. That game it's is great. so wild. Uh, the yeah. XCOM the XCOM devs were saying it's influencing how they make their next game because the movement system in that game is really good. Yeah, yeah. So we see. Uh, Soldiers jumping on top of each other. <laughs> I hope so. uh, but yeah, no, I'm curious. Like, so, what do you think about developing for the Switch? Like, what do you think um, has to happen for for sort of your studio to be able to tackle that challenge? Uh, ooh, I think uh, first of course there there is the, um, the, the you know the the, the the overall business proposition, which needs to make sense. Just the the amount of the, the cost versus the uh, the benefit. And in terms of cost, the, our game is quite uh, demanding. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, of course, there are, you know they can make uh, the, the Witcher on Switch. But one of the, the key things is what what's in our game is the um, the the AIs would take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So best CPU load. Um, so when you see one of these battles here, mm -hmm. uh, they, they can take up to a half an hour or so to play out a typical battle or you know, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the AI fights these battles as well. You know, when it's an AI turn and they they, they t take over a, um, a city of, of independence or a little uh, a bit of loot that they capture, the AI actually plays this entire battle Operation. using uh, the exact same um, uh, battle map mm -hmm. with all of the abilities and everything, uh, just in a in a, in a in a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. In in, uh, in 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 hundreds of a second, actually, uh, mm -hmm. if you've got a fast CPU. So, uh, and a lot of these battles can spawn uh, during a turn, um, and and you know we already have had to make optimizations for lower spec CPU machines, like lower spec uh, laptops, for example, uh, mm -hmm. to keep the, the speed up. Well, yeah, the switch is, of course, in, 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 in architecture, is a handheld de de device. Um, and, and the question whether or not uh, we could get everything like that on the switch, is uh, that's one of the first questions we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so but ensuring that the CPU load would, uh, would be manageable. But the Switch is a, is a beautiful machine, fast machine. Maybe it works, but I, I can't answer that now. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, but it is interesting to know that like the challenges aren't just say graphical or getting things running, but you know allowing the AI to to properly do what it needs to do in in the background and run simulations yeah. like this. And there's practical things as well, like uh, screen size. You know, we, uh, we uh, if you play it uh, undocked and just going on the screen, we might want to change some interfaces. Uh, mm -hmm. in order to make them clearer uh, when seen on such a small screen without using a magnifying glass. That's a, that's a good point. Um, we, yeah. are, uh, uh, da, 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 we are coming up at the end of our hour here as I try to uh, uh, make my way through this battle, which he said can take up to half an hour. So this might be, we might be still be playing this battle by the time we're over given <laughs> the way I play games. Uh, um, ooh, burning ground. That's not good. Um, uh if you've got questions uh, for Leonard, we are still happy to ask them. Um, uh, Leonard, I guess here's something interesting. Um, we're talking, we're playing a turn-based, you know, like, uh, tactical... This is a tactical encounter. Um, whether you're playing Fire Emblem or XCOM, the percentage chance to hit is very important because it tells, it sort of tells you whether it's a good idea to try this maneuver or not. I'm still feeling mm -hmm. out... In XCOM, you can have a 92% chance to hit, and those misses feel really sour. In Fire yeah. Emblem, you can have a 92% chance to hit, and they, those misses don't really come. Like, 92% in Fire Emblem sort of means 100%. Like, how do you accurately communicate to the player um, uh, what that sort of means, uh, what different hit chances mean yeah. in a game like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we don't... 
uh, really skew the numbers. <laughs> Maybe some games do, I don't know. So when you have seen 90, 92% is actually 100%. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so we don't, uh, we, we actually have a very clear rule and that is that um, basically whenever you have a, a there's always a 25% chance to grace and that starts over 100%. So if you have a 75% chance uh, to hit, uh, that basically means that you will always hit or grace. So the 25% uh, will be grace. And then if you go lower than 75%, that's when the hit, the miss chances start to come in. So if you go to 70%, there's a 5% chance to miss. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the extremes that you have a 90% chance to hit or a 95% chance to miss, and you will totally miss the shot. Mm -hmm. You will always do some damage. Right. So that's how we solved it. Yeah, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, one other thing is that a lot of our um, units, especially uh, like when carrying like assault rifles and stuff, they fire multiple shots. And the number of shots depends on how far you move. So if you stay in the green area for this unit, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, this is actually a single shot unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you if that's w that was a marine or a trooper, mm -hmm. uh, you could have three shots when you stay in the green area, uh, and that of course. Uh, spreads out the um, the damage more. Right on. Uh, I'm about to do my favorite thing in any science fiction game, which is uh, drop a laser on someone's head. All right. Woo! Boom. <laughs> yeah. I love doing that. Uh, uh, when's uh, Lyle? Hey guys. Like... Sorry. <laughs> Would Zlai would like to know, are there any plans to get the AI to uh, approach yes. auto combat carefully? 12 versus uh, 4... Uh, "Quote unquote should never lo result in the lost unit." I don't know if that's necessarily true from a from a how armies work perspective. If you send twelve people in to fight four, one of those people might get just totally wasted. Um, so from a game field perspective, I certainly think it's fine. But uh, I don't know. If they're curious. Like they they would like to know if auto battles, which I was using to get through most of the stream, so we could keep on the top sort of the top layer. Um, how do you feel you did with those? Do you think do you think they're accurate? Do you think it's it's okay for for if you're overwhelmingly abusing the enemy's forces to if you go auto battle to have to sacrifice a unit to, to essentially speed up time because when you're in here you can make optimal decisions obviously yeah yeah you will I mean it's up to you if you want to take the risk I mean we give some sort of prediction mm -hmm. uh, how the battle will end up I mean it's a purely um, a sort of a value comparison so it's not necessarily like how well particular stack of units is, is uh, kitted out to kill another stack. Mm -hmm. It's just purely the value that, that these two, so that, that gives an indication. Um, but yeah, some people c can't stand a, a loss and uh, we, we, we're looking into maybe for a future update, and I can't really promise that yet, but we're looking into ways like if you press auto and you don't like the results, you can go back to manual. So you, you'll have a, a sort of like an, an option to, to retry. That's kind of interesting. I, 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 I think that's that's interesting. Uh, but then you don't get to re-auto. Ooh, I like that. Uh, um, uh, um, Leonard, I have a question. Um, games are more live now than ever. They, they don't. You know, you, you guys just shipped this game. But you already. We were talking about the stream. You're, you're, you're tossing around update ideas. Um, uh, lots of other games have begun to adapt everything from you know quote unquote events where. You know, Apex Legends is having an event right now. Um, obviously, that's an always live multiplayer game. But mm -hmm. then there's Paradox is a really good DLC model where they sell individual DLC packs. Um, mm -hmm. How have you thought as a studio leader, even though obviously you've got Paradox sort of there sitting there and uh, coddling you in their great big publisher arms. Yeah, they're sitting off screen. Oh, they're, they're sitting <laughs> off screen. Oh, oh, hi, hi Papa nice. Paradox. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Um, but no, yeah, but like, what are your thoughts about making games like this work in a live games environment? Like, strategy games are getting bigger. People love to just sit down and spend hours. They don't want huge microtransactions in this, you know, a huge microtransaction structure in here or a, or, or any kind. A lot of those systems might be alien, but at the same time, they're also growing. Like, they're growing more important in the world of keeping games afloat and keeping players interested. What do you think is sort of the way strategy games can approach existing in a live games world? Yeah, well, live games for us means uh, interacting with the community, getting feedback and, and listening to them and, and uh, dropping new features both as free updates and as, as premium content. And um, premium content, I mean, you know, not microtransactions. Uh, we prefer substantial updates, but it could very well be that we make some um, 
some new outfits uh, for uh, commanders, for example. But uh, anything um, we do, uh, yeah, it's all about just improving the game for as many people and for as long people uh, for as long as we can. Um, and that, uh, yeah. yeah, like you say, the uh, you know, like making a game like this sort of a free-to-play um, experience. People have tried that with strategy games, but mm -hmm. not a lot of have succeeded in, in, uh, in doing that. Unless you talk, if you, unless you consider something like Clash of Clans a strategy game. I mean, they do, but not you know, like it's not like a strategy <laughs> game. It's different. Um, it's different. Yeah, it's different. It's a it's a different type of strategy game. That's just going it's to hurt my strategy game. Yeah. Dude, so I'm just going to relive my my X Wing night last night where I had to basically, even though I was ahead, I had to give up a shot on, and I may really need to get. Okay, cool. Yay, we, yay. Um, ba -ba -ba. um, oh, uh, Crafty Dog would like would like you to know this is just kind of a fun thing from chat. They pre-ordered um uh top tier uh oh geez something got in the way they they bought the top tier when they pre-ordered and they're looking forward to what you are doing in the future in terms of the uh the expansions yeah, yeah. and neo neo angel helmet also says it's a wonderful game uh um uh ooh, uh this is kind of a good question they meant you mentioned a uh the satellite system that got cut you know kind of that atmosphere level um uh they would like to know what other kind of features got cut making this game uh, when you were, like, what ideas were really good and, I don't know, like, that's something I'd like to know about, too. Like, what else did you have to cut to get this game out the door? Which sounds grim, but, uh, mm. um, but, you know, we're all, it's always curious, like, what, what has to, what good ideas just weren't as good? Uh, well, some ideas are, are, are were, were cut and we might want to go back to, so I'm probably not going to talk about those, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, we went through a couple of iterations of the sector system, and one of them where, uh, was that the actual colonists that you had in your, in your colony, uh, were slotted into slots that were actually living in, inside of the, um, in, in, inside of the sector. So if you lost a particular, uh, sector you could lo lose the colonists that were in that sector but that was quite a clumsy system so we we decided to uh, to cut it um okay um i am going i want to oh, no Alyssa. i want one i want one i want to uh muhammad kapil in chat uh has a question that i wanted to ask earlier but i forgot to follow up on um they were asking about that ai system you said where two ai battles will just uh simulate the entire thing on the actual map um what was the decision for doing a more like resource heavy um way of determining the outcome of a battle versus something just like a statistical coin flip or something a lot more a lot less in depth but more uh light on the resources yeah, we, we had such a system in, uh, in, in the old Age of Wonders games because the computers weren't fast enough to do it. Mm -hmm. But that led to all sorts of problems because you were basically creating two AIs which, which, which had basically, because you weren't really simulating the battle, you were just like subtracting army strength. So you had like, you know, like one particular unit which was immune to the effects of another type of unit, mm -hmm. but you couldn't really model that. Uh, you know, so like when you played manually, you, you would get such very different results from a battle than when you played automatic and and also you you couldn't really go back and replay the battle and see the battle as it would un unfold there was sort of a simulation mm -hmm. without movement that that sort of approximated it uh but in the end just totally simulating the battle um yeah it allows you to see cool replays and immediately see how the ai did maybe for a beginning player learn the game uh to see how the ai would move uh, mm -hmm. stuff so basically, you 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 debug one thing, and, uh, and that's it. You don't have to work on two systems. Uh, one of it's is sort of an approximation, and the other is sort of the real AI. So there's one AI that you write. Um, so it stays true to like the strategy genre versus just like a numbers game. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Right on. Um, with that, I am going to start wrapping things up. Thank you, Alyssa, for jumping in with a good question. Yeah. That was actually, <laughs> that was actually good. Um, thank you all for joining the GDC. Good question. Joining us Thank you, chat, for giving it to us. Thank I don't you. want to steal someone's good question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can you can wrap up now. I'll stop. <laughs> you can't see me. I'm glaring. <laughs> shaking your head. I'm just shaking my head. Alyssa, take you. you that was a, you, you asked it. You can I'd, take credit. It was worded in chat for. This is stuff anyway. we should not do live on camera i'm sorry <laughs> um uh anyway uh thank you everyone in chat you've been a great audience today thank you leonard for for dropping by thank you all for yeah. watching the gdc twitch channel this is a place 
where we talk about talk to game developers about the making of their games, how they get made, um, because that uh, sharing knowledge between game developers is kind of our mission. Um, speaking of which, uh, if you were a, at home and you are a game developer of any stripe or experience or background, we would encourage you to uh, check out the GDC call for submissions. Uh, the core concepts call for submissions closes tomorrow. If you have a talk idea, if you're at home, if you're lurking out there, I know you are. Uh, one of you, pe some of you people are game devs. Um, uh, if you are the kind of person who has worked on a game and has something in the last year and something interesting to share about it, we encourage you to submit a talk. If you do in the next 24 hours, uh, it will can go into the core concepts track. We will be opening our summits VRDC. Um, no, it's it's all summits, but that includes our VR our VR summit, our narrative summit, our AI summit. Um, those call for submissions is going to open up later this month. So if you are a developer working on uh, um, that kind of stuff, please submit a talk at the end of the month. If you're a VR AR developer, join us at the in October for XRDC. Um, for more information on that, you can scroll down and check out uh, um, uh, gdcconf.com, which also will you can use that to get over to XRDC. Um, if you're new to the channel, we would appreciate it if you clicked the follow button, because if you do, you'll get notifications when we go live. We're talking to a lot of developers. There's some really cool games out there that are coming out in the next few weeks i wish i could confirm which ones we're we're getting but it's still i'm still working with some great pr folks to, to try and get those interviews to you um uh but rest assured if you hit that follow button you will get a notification when we go live and when we go live we will go live with someone who knows more about making games than we do and we know something we know something about making games right Alyssa? you know about financials yeah, you know I have of, to write some today. <laughs> you have to write some financial slip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we know something, but we you know we just want you to talk to people who know more some things. Um, with that, uh, I am going to uh, resist the urge to just keep playing and just keep because uh, that 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 uh, just one more turn it's just scratching really hard right now. Um, but I'm going to resist the urge to keep playing and sign off. Leonard, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks everybody for the questions. Right. Bye, folks. Bye. Right. Bye bye.